Good morning everybody. So here I am in Cusco. Sun just came up 6.08 a.m. Had a little stop off, had a little espresso. And now I'm heading to Puno on Lake Titicaca. So I've been here for five days. Uh, seen the valley, uh, sacred valley of the Incas, Machu Picchu. An amazing, amazing time. Um, Cusco is uh, pretty high up, and the, the temperature is it, it gets pretty cool. You know, down to about three or four in the morning, uh, right now, three or four uh, centigrade, and uh, yeah, it gets to about 12, 13 during the day. Um, beautiful, beautiful city. Um, it's in the tourist area, so it's a lot cleaner than normal. Once we get out of here, it gets to being uh, garbage everywhere again. Um, but uh, I'll make it to Puno and then I head to Bolivia. Um, but yeah, so I had one great day of uh, riding out to basically the foot of uh, Machu Picchu. Um, and then uh, from there uh, to go to Machu Picchu I actually uh, took, took the easy way and uh, took a train um, decided to splurge a little bit and uh, get out of this lane And uh, took the, uh, it's called a Hiram Basher, Hiram Basher. It was a guy who, who was a US or British guy who came here. I think he was British, but he was based out of the US. Who came here in uh, early 20th century, about 1910, looking for treasures, as, as we all, all the pilferers did. And, um, was then some summarily directed to where he wasn't looking. And um, he found Machu Picchu, which was in a bit of a dilapidated state that had been overgrown by trees, had been deserted for a long, long time. And uh, he said about um, uh, documenting everything, he, ph he photographed his first visit, which is quite amazing back then. And uh, since then it's become the icon that it is today. And uh, yeah, so, the, so how you get there is Machu Picchu is a bit of a pain in the ass, uh, and and probably for, for a good re for a good reason. It's um it's way way up there. You actually got the sun right in my eyes and my visor. Fucking what are you doing, you fucking idiot? Or, or, to get, or to make a left turn. Or to make a left turn five metres later. Try to come up my inside. You're brilliant. You're a genius. So yeah, um, so how you, you've got two ways to get there. You can do it the really, really, or three ways. The really, really hard way. Or you can book through uh, Peru Rail and... Uh, and you've got two choices there. There's another train. There's another 
a company called Inca Rail, but it uses just the carriages on Peru Rail, so yeah, much and much less. And then there's a, the, and so you can do that and do it your own thing and just buy a train ticket and do all that, or you can buy a, a complete pass type thing which gets you a pick up from your hotel, your bus to the train station, your train, and then your bus up the mountain to Machu Picchu. Um, that would be the smart way. I wouldn't recommend it doing the other way because then you've got a, you've got about three or four drop-offs and pickups, and get one wrong and you're screwed. People do do it because it saves them, you know, a bit of money. But you're not to go to Machu Picchu in total. You're not going to do it unless you spend three or four hundred dollars anyway. I decided to go first class on this Hiram, ba Hira, Hiram Bash, ah, oh, freaking forget its name, Hiram Bingham, that's it, Hiram Bingham train, and um, they pick you, I'm in the wrong, wrong lane here, I'm going to negotiate something here, I've got to get the first exit, and I'm in the wrong lane by a mile, Jeez, I'm going to do this easy. Um, so you get picked up by a nice car, you get taken to a nice bus with all dancers and food and drink supplied, you get onto an absolutely gorgeous train, like it's an old train but it's done up beautifully, it doesn't make much noise, goes nice and slowly. And um, and then you get a, a, a bus and you don't have to wait in any lines anywhere. And then you get you don't have to wait in lines to get into Machu Picchu when everyone else is in a line. Um, and then you basically then you basically walk up some steps and a bit of a walk and then bang, it's just there. It's incredible. Um, That's sun right in my freaking face. Um, so if you can't hear me well enough, I'm sorry, but I can't, I just can't see. Yeah, so, uh, and then from the, you know, on the train you get like a three course lunch. And you know, the train's just not crowded because it's so expensive. It's like $700, $750 US dollars. So again, you're probably spending an extra three, three fifty, maybe four hundred, to go the, the the whole hog. But I, I really do highly recommend it. If you, if, I mean, it, it is a rip off, but it's a rip off either way, um, because it's all controlled by just a couple of companies. So I highly recommend doing the uh, here in Bingham, and you get a, a private tour guide and a little group of like four, four or six people. We only we had four or five in ours, I think. I think we had five. One guy, one Chinese guy complained that he was talking too much and we weren't moving fast enough. We were there for five hours, so he could have moved twice as slow and we still would have seen everything. Um, so yeah. Uh. Hello again, everybody. Uh, yeah, so that was just a little bit of me leaving, uh, leaving Cusco and just talking about my trip on to Machu Picchu and uh, and everything that that entailed and um, it was uh, I had a really good time there five days but I was ready to move on again and this is these are photos from my trip to Puno which is on Lake Titicaca um, that's the actual big city of Pura, Puno I had a few chances to get a little bit off-road and get some shots of Lake Titicaca which is really famous lake inland lake um it's huge um and that's what it, why it's so famous because i think it's one of the biggest inland, inland lakes in the world um but uh it was it, today was uh was about getting uh, getting um a fair way into my trip to, to get getting towards um uh, bolivia so um you know it's few people have told me about lake titicaca and and 
and and that it's really cool and um, but there's not much to see and and I sort of knew that going in um, so I basically um, I basically thought well look I just gotta uh, get there I did a couple of route I did a couple of loops so I, I didn't get, actually go straight there and um, it took me a long 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 time but I left at six in the morning um, and got there in the evening um, and I was having some problems with my camera on this particular day so it was a little bit of a pain that I wasn't able to show you some more videos um, what I, I'm not sure what actually happened but some of the files were corrupted so but it was a nice ride I mean you, you're basically riding through valleys for most of the day um, and you get uh, you get pretty high up uh, <coughs> even even in Puno um, you're still at uh, at sorry at Puno and Lake Titicaca you're still at around about 3,000 meters uh, so it is I, I think it is the highest inland lake in the world um, and it's a cool place. Uh, the, the the hotel I stayed at was right on a point, um, up a little bit of a muddy dirt track, um, but it was uh, <coughs> it was it was a cool spot, you know. And um, the e even though the the um, even though the the weather wasn't fantastic when I was there, um, it you know I still I still. Had, I had a fair bit of time to have a look around and stuff like that, um, and uh, and the, the the hotel took me on a little boat trip across across the water to the manager of the hotel. They have some fish farms as well there, so I went across on on, the, on a little skiff and uh, and had a look at some of the uh, the fish farms, and they're just freaking brimming with. Uh, with fish, it's crazy. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit of a, and I'm not a real believer in fish farms, only because you know they they take well they used to use krill, which basically uh, they had to get massive amounts of krill, which basically was you know a lot of the whales and that feed on krill, and it, you know krill is really important for the ecosystem of the oceans and stuff like that. So they've they've had to go to feed now, and they use this sort of uh, a, a sort of feed that's not really great. Um, and you know, like we we create these problems for ourselves, and then companies create solutions for them, and that's the way you know it works. And it's not a bad thing, you know. Um, however, sometimes the solutions aren't that flash, and uh, <clears throat> it does have an effect on the on the quality of the water and. Um, yeah, and it's just I don't know. I'm a bit, bit skeptical, skeptical of it all. So, um, yeah, I understand the need for it because basically, um, I mean, I used to date a girl years and years ago that uh, her father was a fisherman, and he used to come in with his boat. Um, they used to catch this fish called orange ruffy, and um, it, his boat would take a hundred tons of it at a time. His ship made a fortune out of it but the problem was is that um, they didn't they didn't know much about the fish the orange ruffy fish and what happened was is basically the fish that they were catching was 50 60 years old and they don't mature to uh, for breeding until they're <coughs> excuse me until they're um, until they're about 20 so basically they nearly decimated all of the orange ruffy stocks and people say, oh, well, you know, you can let them self-regulate and stuff like that, but they don't because they're competition and they want to make money and they're putting food on the table and all the crew are, and so they'll just catch as much as they can and then they'll move on to the next fish stock, the next next type of fish to, to drain out. So, you know, countries are always battling trying to get a, a happy medium between having a fishing industry, which is good, and having fish stocks. You know, and you know now that they they study these and they understand it, you know um, the, the the fish stocks are going to come back hopefully. But you know that's a pretty it's a pretty tall order to have a, um, a an edible fish called orange ruffy that takes 20 years to before it's uh, before they can start um, they start breeding or 10, 15, 20 years before they start breeding. 
So, um, <clears throat> again, Peru, you, you just skip through on the um, on the uh, on the tolls. You, uh, motorbikes don't have to pay. Some of those, some of the areas they assign for motorbikes to drive around are pretty slim. And if you've got a full bike packed with the with the side cases, you've got to be a little bit careful. But all in all, it was a pretty good ride day. Um, the 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 roads were decent enough, you know, they weren't they weren't amazing or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> I was going to be happy. I loved Peru. The people are just absolutely fantastic. But I was going to be happy to get out of there because it was a pretty ultra dangerous riding. Um, only because the buses were just insane. Um, and having to deal with them all the time, you just had to be on your toes all the time. They just didn't really care about anybody else on the road. You know, they, they, these are mainly the local buses, not the big interstate, uh, intercountry tourist buses. Um, because normally they had a few drivers in each, in, uh, in them. And, but they, they did always took unnecessary risks. But it was beautiful riding and, you know, passing through rivers, valleys and amazing scenery. But I was keen to get, after, after, a, few, after a week or two in uh, Peru, I was keen to get into Bolivia and, and see what that had to offer. Um, but uh, Peru, great food great people the indigenous people are so beautiful they're so lovely um, I'll talk a little bit about my, my final experiences in the next video as I cross into uh, Bolivia uh, I, I fixed the camera up um, I just put a new memory card in the camera after today and that seemed to fix the problem um, you know that with with the camera you, you've got with the drift goes desk you know, you've got to expose the elements a lot of the time, especially I have, the, I have the, the, the thing on the back taken off so that I've got my speaker going in there. Um, <clears throat> it's just a little bit frustrating where sometimes you just don't know whether you get that crackling noise going through it and you just don't know until you get the video. One day they work fine or even for half a day it works fine and then it starts the crackling noise and it's too annoying to for anyone to listen to. Um, but yeah, so basically sweeping across um, the east, eastern side of, uh, of Peru, up pretty high, it's actually fairly cool, it's not like, not very warm. <laughs> um, it's probably around about 10 to 15 degrees um, uh, Celsius, uh, you know, which, which is, which is, it's not too bad. I mean, that's, you know, it's about 50, 50 to 60 um, Fahrenheit. Um, but it is pretty cool and then you're going through some towns, some really cool little towns along the way and um, getting a little bit lost because of the one way situation again and uh, going for, you're going on the highway from one to another and this is entering Puno, quite beautiful from above, um, you know, pretty crazy views and stuff that, that then into the city, that's not a crazy view, uh, but yeah, I really enjoyed uh, the, the sites I had to stop off and you, you sweep right down into the city of Puno from up top so it's a pretty cool view down below um, yeah but anyway guys if, if you have any questions or comments leave them below and uh, we'll talk again soon no doubt